the ability of the blockchain to scale in terms of transaction velocity. Uh, I'm not particularly worried about that because there are a number of ways we can overcome it. And uh, there is enough incentive in place to do that. Uh, one is bundling transactions in Merkle routes that are stored off blockchain and referring simply to the root hash. Uh, so that you can essentially have transactions that occur off the blockchain but are then signed by the blockchain in retrospect. Um, if today you uh, use something, for example, on Coinbase, which is a San Francisco-based wallet company, and you transfer money from one wallet to another, it doesn't go on the blockchain. If you buy something from a merchant who is using Coinbase, the coin is transferred off blockchain to that merchant. Essentially, it's fractional reserve banking implemented in digital currency. Um, I'm not worried about the transaction limit. There's lots of ways we can do it. And, and quite honestly, bandwidth and storage are accelerating faster than uh, our need for transaction growth. So the Moore's law applies to storage, and Moore's law applies to bandwidth. So we have the ability to simply ride that acceleration, and you know, a couple of iterations of doubling, and things get really, really big, really, really fast. Uh, so I'm not particularly worried uh, about the blockchain reaching a terabyte in size. The other reason is because um, you don't need the whole blockchain. Uh, there is a system called simple payment verification that allows you to use uh, the block depth instead of the block height and rely on other nodes as proxies. So what you're saying is, if the miners have buried this under six blocks and they have a full index, I can trust that by this point it's safe. I don't need to know the 277,000 blocks below it to verify every input and output because I know the miners have done that. So you get this trust by proxy. Not worried about the scalability at all. Uh, the second question is the issue of trust. There's two aspects to this. The first one is, welcome to a free market. Um, the current financial system works through uh, essentially a methodology of trust by exclusion. You deny access to the vast majority to allow access only to the vetted few. I can't go to the Federal Reserve lending window. I can't get uh, an accredited investor account on the New York Stock Exchange. I cannot connect to the Visa network and query it with an API, because their trust depends on properly vetting me before they give me access. Bitcoin's trust by computation allows access for everyone and innovation at the edge. So it shifts the trust model dramatically. It is the basis of decentralization. And that has two effects. The first one is that for the first time in financial services, we don't need permission to innovate. And for the last 50 years, no innovation has happened in financial services, really. And the reason for that, well, there has been innovation on creating more and more complex derivatives to rob people. But in terms of innovation that actually changes people's lives, especially here in the Western world, the banks are navel-gazing on tap to pay so I can spend 200 fewer calories when shopping because I don't need to actually touch the machine and swipe. I can do it from three inches away. Like, really? <laughs> um, or we could uplift a couple of billion of poor people around the world. You know, mm, difficult choice. But let's do tap to pay. Um, there is 50 years of pent-up innovation that has been unleashed by Bitcoin. And I'm seeing the startups, because a lot of them come to talk to me before they go public. You have no idea what's coming. There are hundreds and hundreds of startups doing incredibly innovative things in Bitcoin, on the fringes, without asking anyone. So when you have a completely free market, that means that the offerings will span from the incredibly innovative, ground-shaking, you know, ground world-changing innovation that blows your mind, to the 419 Nigerian scam pump and dump coin. And it's your job to figure out which is which. So caveat emptor. That's exactly what happens. We are now being exposed to a free market in currencies and financial systems where the burden of confirming trust rests with the buyer. Now, that's a good thing, and it's a bad thing. Quite honestly, the current system is one where the burden of trust relies on Visa. and They allow you to send donations to the Ku Klux Klan, but they don't allow you to send donations to WikiLeaks. And I have a problem with that. So I don't trust them to make that decision for me. I'd rather make it myself. The other thing you have to realize is that for the first time in history, we have programmable money. And you can do really interesting things. So we can start innovating in terms of security and trust with programmable money. For example, 
programmable escrow, transactional escrow encoded directly into the system, allows you to, to create counterparties that you choose and trust to act as trusted intermediaries between you and the recipient of the money. So that if your item does not arrive, the signature won't execute. So we can reinvent trust mechanisms through programmable money. And so yes, there will be a lot of fraud. Um, but there's also financial innovation that can happen to prevent that fraud without handing control back to the corruptible institutions that use it to promote their own policies. <laughs>